Welcome to Supply and Demand Individual Markets. This is Chapter 3. It's one of the most important units in our pursuit of economic knowledge. A market is simply a place where buyers and sellers come together. It can be very complex, like a stock market, or it can be a garage sale. Markets simply bring buyers and sellers together. Welcome guys, this is Supply and Demand Individual Markets Chapter 3. Uh, first part talks about what a market is, and that's simply where buyers and sellers come together. It can be a very elaborate type scenario, such as a stock market, or it could be as simple as a garage sale. This slide shows the demand schedule. Demand schedule is simply the amount that individuals would buy at given prices, um, all things being equal. Remember, our shifters come a little bit later, and we can't change things when we're trying to construct a demand curve. We can only look at the impact price has on quantity. OK, here is the law of demand. The law of demand is that relationship that we constructed in class that shows an inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. As the price falls, quantity demanded rises. As price rises, quantity demand falls. Again, this relationship's inverse, and it makes sense. As the price of something rises, we typically to purchase less of it. Price of something falls, we tend to buy more of it. This relationship exists for three reasons. Diminishing margin utility. In class, we did a little scenario where somebody kept getting suckers and their utility went down. As you get less satisfaction from consuming the same product, the only way that a company can entice you to buy more is to lower the price. The income effect, one feels richer, wealthier, when a certain portion of their budget goes to lunch for, say, burgers. And those burgers go down in price, they can buy more, the effect is they feel richer. Substitution effect, let's say you don't normally buy burgers and you buy hot dogs, but if burgers are on sale, you see them as a cheaper alternative to your hot dog lunch. This talks about the determinants of demand, and we're going to go through those here in a second. Determinants, unlike price of the product, cause the entire demand curve to shift. An increase in demand is demonstrated as a shift of the curve to the right, which causes price and quantity to rise. A decrease in demand is a shift down into the left of the curve. Here are some things that can cause shifts in the entire curve. One is taste and preferences. Up in the left hand corner we see James Dean. Smoking was cool in the 60s. And advertisers advertise smoking, increasing the demand for cigarettes. Look down in the corner. Ah yes. It's the effects of smoking long term. Not so glamorous, right? So with anti-smoking campaigns, the demand for smoking fell, lowering the price and quantity consumed. Number of buyers, same idea. If there's an increase in the number of buyers, like the Chinese for Pepsi, the demand goes up, price and quantity up. If there's a decrease in the number of buyers, the demand goes down, price and quantity down. That'll cause the demand curve to change. Uh, let's look at two different types of goods. Down below, we see a Lamborghini. Yay, it's red. It's beautiful. It's fast. Um, normal goods and superior goods, we'll talk about those later. Uh, but normal goods are goods that have a direct relationship with income. As your income goes up, the demand curve goes up with these. And most goods are normal goods. Uh, cars, homes, trips, new clothes, restaurant meals. Um, things that you typically buy more of when you have more money. There are, however, some goods known as inferior goods. And these are a little different. Inferior goods have an inverse relationship with income. As your income goes up, you tend to buy less of these. Uh, spam, uh, retread tires instead of new tires, used uh, clothing from Goodwill, that sort of thing. We also have related goods. Related goods are goods that have a relationship where the change in the price of one causes the demand curve of the other good to change. One type of related good are substitutes, such as Coke and Pepsi. A direct relationship exists between Coke and Pepsi. For example, it sounds like I need some Pepsi. For example, if we raise the price of Coke, 
the quantity demanded of Coke will fall. However, demand for Pepsi will rise. Change in price of the Coke market leads to a change in demand in the other market as the goods are seen as substitutes. Compliments. For example, hot dog and hot dog buns. If the price of hot dogs goes up, we would expect the demand for hot dog buns to go down, thus an inverse relationship. Price in one market, hot dogs, and the change in demand in the related market. So here are the determinants of demand. Taste and preferences, buyers, incomes, including both normal goods and inferior goods, prices of related goods, substitutes and complements, and some goods aren't related. We wouldn't expect an increase in the price of shoes to have much impact on peanut butter. And expectations. Generally with expectations, if we expect the price of something to rise in the future, we will purchase more of it now. If we expect the price of something to fall in the future, we will purchase less of it now. General expectations about the economy are impacted here as well. If the economy is doing well and we expect to have our job maybe a raise in the future, we may buy the new car. If we hear in the news that things are going downhill and there are layoffs all over the country, then we might expect negative uh, impacts in the future, negative economy in the future, and we wouldn't buy the car at that time. Standard demand curve drawn out. You can see that we've plotted the points and we can see the inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. Okay, here's an increase in demand where the curve shifts to the right, D to D prime, as opposed to moving along the existing curve by changing price. And here's a decrease in demand. The entire curve shifts. If you put supply over that in your mind, you can see the price and quantity going down as the demand curve shifts down, as opposed to moving along the demand curve when there is a change in price. Supply, as we talked about, is upsloping. A direct relationship exists between price and quantity supplied. As price goes up, quantity supplied goes up. This is simply because producing becomes more profitable for companies as the price rises. That gives us our law of supply. As price rises, the quantity supplied rises. As price falls, the quantity supplies falls. An inverse relationship, giving us our equilibrium of a downward sloping demand curve and an upward sloping supply curve. And we see the direct relationship. The price of corn is going up and the quantity consumed or sold provided in the marketplace is going up. And here are determinants of supply. Resource prices, anything used to make the product. If the price of an input goes down, the supply increases, a shift down to the right. If the resource price becomes more expensive, labor or gasoline for a trucking industry, the supply decreases, up to the left, price up and quantity down. New technology or better technology shifts the supply curve to the right. Think of the supply of grain going from harvesting with a scythe to a ox-drawn or horse-drawn threshing machine to a John Deere modern tractor. Taxes and subsidies. Taxes shift supply back, raising price and decreasing quantity. Subsidies increase supply, causing price to go down and quantity to go up. A subsidy is simply a payment or a stipend to a producer to create something and lower their cost. Prices of other goods and expectation. Prices of related goods. I have to think of the good I'm producing and any other good that I could produce using the resources that I'm using to make good A, uh, could they be used to make good B. Uh, for example, corn. If I think the price of corn is going up in the future, I'm going to plant more now, an increase in supply. However, if I think corn might stay the same, but wheat might go up, 
Well, that might be a reduction in the supply of corn because I shift fields of production from corn to wheat. And number of sellers, pretty easy. As the number of sellers increases, the supply increases. Here's a simple increase in supply. We see the curve shifting over to the right. If we have demand over that, we'd see a decrease in price and an increase in quantity at the equilibrium point. Notice that an increase in supply is different than the quantity change, which is just engendered by a change in price. Supply. supply shifting back, price would go up and quantity would go down. Here's our market. We can see where the quantity supplied and quantity demanded are equal at a given price. We have equilibrium. The next slide demonstrates what that equilibrium looks like and why it must occur. So here's our equilibrium. Notice that the quantity supplied and quantity demanded are equal to price. We have no shortage and we have no surplus. The next slides will show what happens if a price is too high in the marketplace or too low. At a price of $4, we see that the quantity supplied is 10 or 10 million bushels, 10,000 bushels. If the price is $4, more is being supplied at the market than is being demanded. The quantity demanded at $4 is only 4,000 bushels. We have 6,000 too many bushels of corn. The corn sits around and rots. No one wants to buy it. No one wants to consume it. The price must go down for that corn to be sold and moved out of the market. Shortage situation. The price is too low. It's at $2 a bushel. Well, at $2 a bushel, the corn market's only producing 4,000 bushels of corn. Some of those acres that were used in corn at equilibrium or higher prices are now growing wheat or full of little chickens running around picking at insects, being nice and organic and tasting delicious. Look at what happens to the demand, though. At, at the price of two per bushel, 11,000 bushels of corn are demanded. We have a shortage. We have a massive shortage and therefore the price will have to rise to eliminate that shortage. Okay, well here are some key terms you want to know. Equilibrium price and quantity, rationing function of prices, a change in demand versus a change in quantity demanded, change in supply versus a change in quantity supplied. In the next chapter, we'll look and see how the slope of these curves determines a whole bunch of cool things from profitability to public policy. I know you can't wait. This is Mr. Kopitsky signing out. See you next time.